Good morning, and thank you for joining the Garvin Institute's Public Breast Cancer Virtual Seminar. My name is Alex Swarbrick. I'm a medical scientist here at the Garvin Institute, and I lead a team of breast cancer researchers, and I'll be your host for today. Now, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Garvin Institute of Medical Research acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, wherever you may be dialing in from, um, and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present, and we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be with us today. Now, it's a real privilege for us here to connect with you, our supporters in the community, and to share the latest in medical research and treatment of breast cancer today. We've got a really exciting program coming up. Um, we've got an interview with a really inspiring breast cancer survivor, Nancy Kalako. Uh, we're gonna hear from one of Australia's finest breast cancer researchers. We'll present awards to two promising young breast cancer scientists, and we'll hear an update on the latest in breast cancer treatment in the clinic. We're gonna finish with an op opportunity for you to ask questions of all our presenters, and you can enter those um, questions using the Q&A function that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom window. So the reason we're here today is because in Australia alone, something like 40 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, 30 years ago, more than a quarter of those women would expect to die from their disease within a few years of diagnosis. Today, that number is less than 10%. Um, of patients who will die within the first five years after diagnosis. And many women go on to live um, very healthy lives um, free from breast cancer. And that progress has been made through research, through um, improved detection and screening, through new diagnostics and new treatments like Herceptin or Tamoxifen. Nonetheless, we can't rest because unfortunately in an average day in Australia, nine women will die of breast cancer. And we know that these women are people with many, otherwise many healthy years of life ahead of them. They're in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and their, their parents, uh, siblings, children, colleagues, and friends. Uh, and their loss greatly impacts our society. So we have a long way to go, but I'm very glad to say that we're making great progress. And we're going to talk about um, that progress today. Now, I would first like to introduce to you um, Kate Gildea who is um, the Marketing and Corporate Communications Manager from our event sponsor, Estee Lauder. And Estee Lauder have been involved in this event and partnering with Garvin in it for over eight years. We're really proud to be part of their breast cancer campaign. Um, Kate is gonna help me to announce two new research grants today awarded by Estee Lauder to support young cancer researchers to undertake innovative projects that could lead to further advancements in their cancer research. So I'd like to introduce Kate from Estee Lauder to tell you more about how Estee Lauder supports um, breast cancer research broadly and these awards. Now, as I mentioned, Kate is the media marketing and corporate communications lead at Estee Lauder, and she oversees corporate social responsibility programs across all the company brands in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and that includes the company's largest, largest social impact program, which is the Breast Cancer Campaign. Please join me in welcoming Kate. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining the call today. We are really honored to be supporting this event again this year. Uh, as Alex mentioned, the Breast Cancer Campaign is the Estee Lauder Company's largest social impact program. And it was founded 29 years ago by the late Evelyn Lauder when she co-created the pink ribbon symbol that has since become an icon of the fight against this disease. The Breast Cancer Campaign is supported by our employees worldwide and to date, we've raised more than 99 million US dollars to support global research, education, and patient services, with more than 80 million of these funds directly supporting medical research grants. 2021 has undoubtedly been a year of ongoing challenges. And whilst we recognize the scale of the health crisis that our world is currently facing, our commitment to defeat breast cancer will not waver. As we enter our fifth year of sponsorship of the Garvin Institute's Breast Cancer Symposium, we are honored to support the team in highlighting the groundbreaking work of their researchers. Opportunities such as these help us to raise awareness amongst the community, inspire action, and ultimately achieve our mission to live in a breast cancer free world. Throughout this year, the Estee Lauder Company's employees across Australia 
continued to come together to raise funds. And it is through their efforts that we're able to offer an Estee Lauder Company's Breast Cancer Research Grant Award. This grant supports early stage breast cancer research, which is critical for PhD students and others starting out their research careers. This funding enables students to gather the preliminary scientific and research evidence needed to apply for competitive peer reviewed funding and government grants. This year, we are honored to award this research grant to not one, but two recipients. Firstly, Louise Baldwin for her work on T cell responses in breast cancer. And then also Sharissa Latham for her work on therapeutically targeting metastatic triple negative breast cancer. On behalf of everyone at the Estee Lauder Companies Australia, uh, we offer our congratulations and thanks to Louise and Sharissa for all their outstanding work. And we hope that these research grants enable some really promising outcomes. We thank you so much to everyone on the call today for supporting the symposium. And I'll now hand you back to Alex to commence the proceedings. Thank you, Kate. Um, what a wonderful uh, gift from Estee Lauder Companies. They're two really promising young scientists here in the cancer research theme. And I'm really excited to see what they can do with that funding um, to take some kind of high risk, high reward um, new research initiatives. So I'm really delighted today to introduce to you Nancy Kalako, who is um, a breast cancer survivor. She, Nancy was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer on the 2nd of February, 2017. So a little over four years ago, <clears throat> she received her medical care here at the Kinghorn Cancer Center at St. Vincent's Hospital under the care of Elgene Lim, who's one of our real superstar doctors. And we're gonna hear from Elgene a little later. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today and offering to share your experience. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure, Alex. Happy to share my story with you. So can you tell me about that day you were diagnosed? What was that like for you? I was diagnosed um, through um, a CT scan I'd had on my spine thinking I had a sore shoulder or a torn ligament. And the phone call came from the... Um, my GP. It really wasn't the extent of the cancer until I was in, in um, hospital and I met with Elgene and bit by bit through one test and another and biopsy and scans that we realized the extent of it was metastatic. So um, perhaps I think I was in a little bit of a disbelief because how can I just be diagnosed at metastatic when I had no symptoms? really very little symptoms. Uh, so that was a devastating blow to say the least, but um, with Elgene on my side, I felt very confident that I had somebody that was gonna look after me. I think no one's prepared for a diagnosis of cancer. No. Um, what was the hardest part about the diagnosis? What was it that most dramatically changed your life for you? Realising that life was never going to be the same again. Realising that the word normal just went out the window. Coming to terms with absolutely every plan that I had, and we all have these plans, you know, when we get to 50, when we get to 60, when we get to 70, when you realise that your lifespan has been compromised, mm -hmm. especially at stage four, you think, well, this, is, this isn't great. Um, it's just coming to grips with mentally and emotionally with you're probably not going to see a lot of those dreams or you're going to have to change the way you think about things and the way that you live. Life is very different after cancer. Uh, your life is defined into two sections once you get this diagnosis, before cancer, after cancer. Basically, that's it, you know. It's a new way of living. It's a new way of be, being. You do adjust. I mean, I have adjusted. I think I've had a lot of help. But in the beginning, grappling with that was the hardest part, the change. What was your life like at the time you were diagnosed? Were you working, for example? Yes, I was full-time. Yeah, I was full-time teaching. I'm a music teacher. I was a teacher at a local Anglican school, actually two Anglican schools. So I was working full time. I was caring for my mother. I was my mother's carer. And 
I have seven grandchildren. I was making all these plans. I was making plans to, um, you know, go overseas, holidays. I mean, all of those things are not impossible, but it's just that planning for those are difficult now, very difficult. And it's got nothing to do with COVID, by the way. It's more, you know, can you go? Can you physically do it? I mean, there are a lot of things that I physically can't do. And that's also because of surgeries that I've had done, two surgeries to my spine to remove two tumours. So because of that, it, it just changes your whole life in that respect. You have, to, you, you have to now look at life through different eyes. And it isn't all bad. It's just it's all new. It's a whole new adjustment. So as you mentioned, Nancy, you were diagnosed with metastatic disease, which is um, a little unusual for a patient to present upfront with that and because metastatic disease is the stage at which the cancer has left the breast and spread to other parts Correct. of the body. And in your case, you mentioned the spine, for example. And, you know, that's notoriously difficult to treat. We, we have to, you know, acknowledge. But here you are four years on, um, full of life from my, my brief interactions with yeah. you, thriving. So um, what's happened since that diagnosis and now? Can you tell us about your treatment and, and how that's kind of yeah. changed your, your outlook? I, I had the opportunity um, in 2019, Elgin approached me with a clinical trial. The letrozole, I had become obviously resistant to the letrozole. I had a, a little setback but, um, and he asked if I would be interested in a clinical trial. Now, I have to be honest here, I, I took a few steps back I didn't know anything about clinical trials. Um, this is the other thing, not knowing, I was in fear of what could possibly happen to me. I made that decision with a lot of thought. Uh, Gene was encouraging. Uh, I realized that uh, his objective was to save my life and do the best that he could for me. So I signed up for it. And, uh, you know, I'm still on this clinical trial two years later, and I've had um, a lot of positive response with this clinical trial. It's made a very big difference to me. That's remarkable. So your sounds like your cancer is responding, is yes. shrinking. Yes. What about the side effects? Have you experienced? No I've, had no, I've had no side effects, and that's remarkable. I yeah. do ask, what, are the, what am I supposed to feel? When I go in, what am I supposed to feel? And well, I don't, whatever it is, I don't have it. So I'm very, very grateful because besides the positive response, I consider myself now to have what we call a normal life again. In fact, I am going back to teaching next year. And that was a long time dream of mine, albeit only probably part time, but I can go back to my normal life. And that being able to do, you know, a stage four metastatic patient, to say that you're going back to work, I think that's, I think it's just, I think it's rare. Um, I don't know how rare, but being able to have that dream and, and start making those plans, you know, feeling normal again for the first time in nearly five years, you know, that's a blessing to me. I, I just feel very lucky. That's really wonderful. And, and you know, wonderful that you've kind of, put your trust in, in your treating doctor and in return participated because, you know, participating in clinical trials is a way to partner with doctors in research. A clinical trial is a research test, the ultimate test of a new idea or a new treatment for patients. And so it, it um, really relies on a very close interaction between patients and, and their doctors. But, you know, from what I know about you, that wasn't really enough for you in terms of giving back and you've done a lot more. And I, from what I understand, you also donated um, excess tissue, cancer tissue collected from you during your procedures to research as well. That's correct. That was while I was in uh, hospital for the first time. And I think it was in within the week, the first week that I was there because I was also in St. Vincent's private for radiation therapy to the spine. And Elgin approached me um, and he, I remember him asked, letting me know that, look, this may not help you, but it could help someone down the track. Now, I'm a mother and I'm a grandmother. I have a daughter, a daughter-in-law. I have um, three little grandchildren. I have nieces. I have sisters. I have grandnieces. And for me, if there's anything that I can do today that will benefit them, down the track, well, then that's worth it. 
So for me, giving tissue was a no-brainer. It wasn't even something I thought about. And I think uh, L. Jean mentioned this to me. I, I don't even remember. I remember he mentioned it to me when he um, we were talking one day that I had said to him, take what you want. I don't even remember, but I did. I did. I said, just take what you want. And that's such an important contribution because, you know, while we use many... Um, kind of laboratory models of disease to understand disease. Ultimately, we need to understand the disease that affects people and we need to study it directly. And so that's a very important contribution. But you've also done more. And I know that you're a fundraiser for Garvin. Yes. Um, you've really got a great page there. I really loved reading it. It's very inspiring. You interviewed your mum. Yeah, um, she's yeah. great. <laughs> and I think people can find that if they if they Google Garvin um, Nancy uh, fundraising, for example. Tell us a little bit about that fundraising you've done. Well, that was birthed from an idea I had to thank, um, especially Elgene, but the Garvin Institute for giving me this gift of a clinical trial that is saving my life. You can't put a price on that. You, you know, I couldn't buy this. I couldn't afford to buy this. This is something that is is giving me so much and I had to find a way how to give back. So I thought a little fundraiser to give back and also to help raise awareness as well. Uh, I think the awareness was one of the big things. So I got together with a, a local restaurant and I will be honest, I had a lot of help with this. This was something that as soon as I began, I started to see a domino effect people started to offer their help. Local mm. businesses started to offer vouchers, prizes, gifts. Uh, strangers were offering me things through Facebook when, they, uh, when I advertised it. Um, friends that I knew, acquaintances, people I knew and didn't know offered help. Uh, as well, um, and more recently, uh, Estee Lauder has offered a gift basket with containing beautiful uh, beauty products for my next uh, fundraiser, hopefully next year. So that fundraiser alone, the one we did in March or April of this year, I raised, I think over $12,500. Notice that, it seems like you smashed your original target. Yes, so about 10,000, <laughs> which is good. But like I said, a lot of help and a lot of other people involved that help make this possible. I know as well that, um, you, I guess, because of everything you've learned going through the, this journey, that you provide peer support to newly diagnosed breast cancer patients. What kind of advice do you give them? Well, the best advice I can give them is to seek um, as much scientific um, advice as possible, as in uh, getting a good oncologist, getting a good medical team to go behind you because this is important. I believe I had an excellent team at Garvin and, and this is, I think, the most important reason that I have progressed as far and as well as I have. That's a wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing your You're story welcome. with us, your time with us, Nancy. My pleasure. Um, and thank you so much for your partnership with, with Garvin and the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. Thank you, Alex. So, um, that's a really wonderful story of Nancy's. I, I encourage you to have a look at her site um, on the Garvin page. It's really um, fun and inspiring and heartwarming. So um, as I mentioned to you, um, I mentioned his name earlier. Elgene Lim is one of our um, superstar doctors and medical researchers here at the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. He's the head of breast medical oncology here at the Kinghorn Cancer Center. He leads a very successful research laboratory and he's an NBCF fellow. I'd like to introduce you to Elgene Lin. Thanks, Alex. And thanks, Nancy, uh, for sharing. Hello, everyone. Every year we honor the memory of Connie Johnson, who together with Sam Johnson established the Love Your Sister charity that supports cancer research, including the Garvin. Um, Connie was an inspirational human being, um, a wonderful uh, person and advocate for research who um, unfortunately passed, passed away from breast cancer in 2017. Each year we honour an outstanding breast cancer 
researcher in her memory. Um, but before we introduce this year's award winner, I'd like to invite Samuel Johnson to say a few words. Hello, my name is Samuel Johnson. I'm the proud co-founder of Love Your Sister, which is an organisation of about a million Australians that are committed to the vanquishment of all cancers so that our families can get on with it. We were set up by the inimitable, the amazing uh, Connie Johnson, my sister, um, who chose not to fight cancer privately, rather she chose to fight it publicly and to improve the lot of others despite her own demise being met. Um, and we feared as she was dying, we feared that the charity would be a flash in the pan kind of charity and that we would die as most not-for-profits do uh, within seven to nine years. Uh, and we've worked hard that that's not the case and um and today is a good day because uh she's she's smiling and nodding today um because the work continues and and we are strong our metrics are arguably um stronger than they were um in our in our heyday um so i'm very proud uh, to announce professor jeff linderman uh, as today's uh, Connie Johnson Memorial recipient. Uh, congratulations, Jeff. Um, and, uh, you know, fingers crossed all going well. We'll have more checks to you guys uh, in the coming uh, future. Um, may you continue your good work. Thanks also to uh, Professor L. Jean Lim. Uh, and thanks and congratulations also uh, to any scientist or researcher that works um, under the Garvin banner. May your good work continue. And I know that uh, the other C word has gotten the headlines lately, but uh, you're front of heart uh, when it comes to us and uh, the million of us now. And you're front of mind. Um, and I hope that you're all doing well, uh, given the current circumstances. Uh, much love and thanks for letting me do a quick video and um, and from the entire Love Your Sister team and, and from my dearly beloved sister, congratulations, Jeff. All the best. Mwah. Thank you very much, Sam. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you this year's Connie Johnson Memorial Award, uh, Lecture Awardee, Professor Jeffrey Lindemann. Jeff is one of Australia's leading clinician scientist focused on breast cancer biology and hereditary breast cancer. He's the joint head of the cancer biology and stem cell division at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, and also a medical oncologist at the Peter McCallum and Royal Melbourne Hospital. Jeff has played an influential role in the discovery of memory stem in daughter cells and gained insights into how female hormones regulate the memory gland development and cancer. Importantly, his discoveries have translated into clinical trials that target estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and prevention trials for women who carry the BRCA1 mutation gene. On a personal level, Jeff has had a major influence on my career and was my PhD uh, supervisor back in the day. Um, his career has been a template in which I've tried to model mine. He's won numerous prestigious awards for his work, including a fellowship um, with the Australian Academy of Science. And we're so honored that he has agreed to receive this award from us this year. On behalf of the Johnson family and in memory of Connie's research legacy through Love Your Sister, congratulations, Jeff. Thank you so much, LJ. Um, it's a real honor to give this award and through the miracles of modern Zoom, um, I've just received it. <laughs> Um, thank you. It's, it's truly an honour um, and I'm grateful to you, Alex, and the amazing team at the Garvin. Uh, thank you also, Samuel, for those inspiring words and uh, for the work that you do. And also, of course, Estee Lauder. Um, it's uh, a, a fantastic tribute to dedication and to, to what um, inspired people can do to help this incredibly important problem, as Alex has outlined. So I thought just in the next uh, few minutes, I'd uh, share a vignette of how our group has really sought to understand and get a handle on breast cancer by really 
looking at um, normal uh, mammary gland or breast development um, because really you've got to understand the processes that go wrong to be able to find new ways to treat and prevent. And I thought I'd just take you through what uh, in hindsight has been a 20 uh, year journey that's culminated in a breast cancer prevention trial for BRCA1 mutation carriers. And as we heard uh, so eloquently from uh, Nancy, um, the, the importance of clinical trials in, in really taking preclinical findings to the clinic and the, the, the role that they play, not only for patients on the studies, but um, the next generation of women. Um, so Alex has actually outlined the problem that, that um, we face in, in the, the uh, you know, globally. There are more than 685,000 deaths per annum from breast cancer. And as he mentioned, about currently about nine per day. Of course, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, things are, are amazingly better than what I can remember when I first started out, um, I guess in the uh, uh, mid to late eighties um, uh, as a clinician. Um, and there have been tremendous uh, improvements, but there's a way to go. And of course, uh, fundamental discoveries need to be made that are going to impact. So we took a step back and looked at um, breast cancer. And really it's not just a single disease. You, you can tell by these images here, how diverse the different types of breast cancer look. Uh, when a pathologist looks at them down the microscope, it's really not a one size fits all um, situation when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer. And about 20 years ago now, the whole landscape for breast cancer changed when a group in the US, um, Chuck Peru and, and colleagues, um, looked at the gene patterns in different tumors in hundreds and hundreds of tumors from patients and literally looked at you know more than 20,000 genes in each of those tumors to look for genes which were up as marked in red or down as marked in green and they were able to categorize a, a genetic or a molecular a framework for us to think about breast cancer and that's really colored the way that things work in the clinic today and in basic research um, and uh, what what uh, we really think about now as a, as a consequence of that is whether tumors are luminal A-like, whether they're hormone receptor positive, whether they express a marker called HER2, or whether they're triple negative. And I'll talk a little bit more about this because this is the type of breast cancers that women with BRCA1 um, mutations often get later. But Jane Visvader and I, who co-led the, uh, co the lab down here at, the, at WEHI, looked at this data and, and just wondered whether these different types of breast cancers could actually represent um, different specific cell types in the breast uh, from which they had arrived. And of course, to understand that, you really need to get a deep understanding of the cell types in the breast and how the breast actually forms. Um, you know, what are the stem cells that are there and how do they give rise to their daughter cells that give rise to the mature ductal tissue and breast? Um, so really it was big questions. Which cells give rise to cancer? What roles do female hormones play? Uh, because of course, breast cancer is um, uh, in large part a, a cancer that affects women, although one in a hundred can um, be, uh, arise in men. And then of course, how can we apply our foundings to treat or to prevent breast cancer? Um, and this, these cartoons here show you the, the, I guess the culprit areas in the breast that we were thinking about. These are the ductal regions that, uh, or epithelial cells that uh, become the milk producing units. And then uh, the exit strategy for milk uh, during lactation, which of course is what the breast was designed for. And we were really thinking about this whole gamish of cells to understand if there was a stem cell, how it gave rise to all of these, what they'd look like, how they would behave, and how all the surrounding cells um, could impact. And the mammary glands actually are really a beautiful organ to try to understand normal development. Most of it actually happens um, postnatally, uh, and there's a real burst of activity in puberty as the female hormones kick in. And then of course, there's multiple rounds of changes that can happen uh, with each pregnancy cycle where full maturation and milk production happens, and then a process called involution. And this can be repeated, of course, uh, for each child that a person has. Um, but I wanna give you an idea visually of um, how dramatic this is. Um, here's a, a picture of what's called the unlager, just a small um, 
a fragment of uh, ducts uh, in a preclinical model in this case. Um, and you can see once puberty kicks in with female hormones, how there's this amazing growth from this small little tree here to this huge ductal tree, which fills the whole breast. And that's all as a result of female hormones. Uh, these, uh, this uh, movie here shows you the ducts where you can see the outer layer of green myopithelial cells. They help squeeze cells through the duct. And then that inner blue layer of cells, which are um, the, uh, which in, in the terminal tissues can be the milk producing cells. And they're often the cells that we think of that give rise to breast cancer. But there are very dramatic changes that happen in the breast. Um, here, uh, we've used a technique where we can actually color code um, stem cells in um, our clinical model breast and then look to see how those stem cells give rise to different regions. And this Christmas tree appearance here um, uh, shows the fragments of, uh, of uh, the areas in the breast tissue that have been uh, derived from a single cell um, based on that um, coloring. But this, this here also gives you an idea of the dramatic changes we see um, uh, at the, as, as a breast is poised for lactation. You can see the, um, these huge um, collections of um, round balls, which are the, the milk factories, if you like. There's the big blue network of, um, uh, of vascular cells, which uh, provide the blood to nourish this process. And those outer myopithelial cells shown in red are the, have really been squeezed apart um, uh, getting milk, the breast ready to produce milk. Um, this image, although it looks like a 2D image, is actually 50,000 images. Um, and so with uh, Anne Rios in our lab developed a 3D imaging strategy, and this has allowed us to literally fly into uh, breast tissue. As you can see here, this is that big duct that would be secreting milk, and then these lobular alveolar units that are the milk producing units. But you made a very curious and remarkable discovery at the time. And that is that once these cells mature, they actually have two nuclei. So the nuclei are like the brain centers of a cell um, and for uh, amazing reasons in the breast, and this doesn't happen very often in the body, uh, two cells form. Uh, and we think that that's to help boost milk production. And of course, these disappear after lactation um, when the breast returns to its normal process. And some of the genetic processes that are involved with that actually also involve genes that can be linked to breast cancer. But we're not only interested in um, the ductal cells, but we're also interested in the cells around the ducts, uh, the immune cells and the stromal cells. And Caleb Dawson in our lab made, I think, a very remarkable discovery. He discovered a, a new class of scavenger cells or macrophages that actually intercalate between those two layers that I've uh, described to you. And they actually sense the environment um, of the cell and presumably help to mop up uh, damaged cells. Um, but what's particularly interesting is that uh, cells with the same phenotype or characteristics are actually found in breast cancer. And so it's going to be very interesting to try to understand how those cells um, help um, uh, cancers grow um, when they misbehave. So going back to the stem cell notion, we, we really uh, started to get a handle on this through our imaging, but also through single cell preps where we could really try to dissect the, the breast down to single cell level to try to understand and identify the stem cell, which is the mother of all of these ductal cells. Um, and of course, this is important because if mutations arise in this, then there'll be mutations in all of the daughter cells um, and they can then accumulate and uh, help give rise to cancers. And some years ago now, two very talented people in our group, Mark Shackleton and Francois, were able to isolate stem cells originally in the mouse models that we were using. Uh, but shortly after that, in fact, that's the time that Elgin was in our lab. And he's a very younger and just a smart looking Elgin um, in that photo there. Um, he helped to identify uh, with Francois uh, the subset of cells that uh, contained human breast cells. And a very remarkable discovery that um, he and our group made at the time was that the characteristics of the tumor types of breast cancer that I've described here at a molecular level, they actually very closely mimicked different types of cells. And so for example, these clinically aggressive triple negative cancers or basal-like tumors, they looked most similar to um, the daughter luminal progenitor cell of a stem cell. 
And through subsequent imaging, we've been able to show how remarkable these stem cells are. So this is uh, this color tracing or confetti approach that we use, whereby a single uh, cell can be color code coded and its progeny um, for, forever uh, will contain that color. And here you can see uh, cells which have been traced for a very long time. And you can see these fields that emerge that have all arisen from a single or a few stem cells. We've also used this approach to try to understand um, breast cancer. And in our preclinical models, we can confetti label um, the uh, progenitor cells and watch how the cells misbehave as tumors arise. And you can see in this top image here, um, different colors of clones that are arising. But then by the time a card carrying tumor has developed, um, certain clones have emerged and there's more clonal restriction. These are all, of course, still very heterogeneous, but you can see how they've arisen from essentially a single aberrant cell. So we're also interested in understanding how hormones can signal um, in this normal breast tissue that we were helping to decipher with others in the field. And one key discovery, I think, was that if the female hormone progesterone can signal to a one of these mature hormone sensor cells, and it can produce a factor called rank ligand, which can feed back to the more primitive cells in the breast to help switch on um, ductal cell production. So rank ligand is something that helps promote the growth of breast cells. Um, one of the things that we then wondered was, well, what about women who have a high risk of developing breast cancer, such as BRCA1 mutation carriers. And of course, the BRCA1 gene has been made famous by Angelina Jolie, um, who carries a faulty BRCA1 mutation. So this, we thought, would be a really good model to try to understand how breast cancers happen. So BRCA1 carriers have a very high lifetime risk of getting breast cancer. Uh, on average, about 72% lifetime risk. There's a high risk of getting other cancers. As I mentioned at the beginning, these are often triple negative tumors, and they can also get ovarian cancers. Uh, but one thing that Belgian found at the time he was looking at these different tumors was that um, that the, um, the BRCA1 tumors and the looked very similar to the progenitor cell that we had described in human breast tissue. Uh, we knew from our laboratory studies on human tissue, as well as in, in mouse models, but particularly with human tissue, that um, uh, it would seem very likely that uh, because of the way they misbehaved in the lab, that these were the culprit cells that gave rise to tumors in BRCA1 mutation carriers. Um, so subsequent to that uh, very talented um, PhD student Emma Nolan was actually able to further characterize these progenitor cells and identify a key subset of cells which uh, contain a protein called rank on their surface. And it, what we now think has happened is that there's a subset of these progenitor cells that are triggered um, into activity by progesterone. So female hormones can signal a mature sensor cell. It produces this uh, marker or protein called rank ligand, which switches on this uh, uh, specific cell. And that can then um, lead to its activation, uh, genetic mishaps, which can give rise to the very explosive types of triple negative cancers we see in BRCA1 mutation carriers. But this identification of rank signaling actually raised new possibilities. Uh, specifically, would it be possible to switch off this cell even before cancers arise uh, by switching off rank signaling? And that's precisely what we were able to do in our um, preclinical laboratory models and also in a, a pilot study where we actually treat um, women um, with BRCA1 mutations or BRCA2 mutations with an inhibitor of this pathway called denosumab. Um, and our preliminary evidence um, and data from others around the world suggests this might indeed be a very promising strategy to prevent breast cancer in this uh, in BRCA1 mutation carriers. So what is denosumab? Um, it's actually something that's been used in the clinic now for quite a few years. It's a monoclonal antibody that could switch off this rank pathway that I've been telling you about. It's used in the clinic to help 
keep bone strong. Uh, that is to treat osteoporosis for women who have weakened bones. And actually for breast cancer patients, it's used um, in their treatment if they've developed bone metastases, um, for example, like those that we heard about from Nancy. Um, it actually has remarkably minimal side effects, especially at the lower doses that are used for osteoporosis. So our question has become, well, can denosumab be repurposed as a breast cancer prevention drug, specifically in the setting for women with a faulty BRCA1 gene? And to that end, we and a group in Austria um, have developed a study called the BRCA P study, which is now open in uh, seven countries around the world. Um, and it's been open um, just as COVID hit, unfortunately, in Australia. But this is, uh, I think, a very hopeful study where we will uh, randomize a large number of BRCA1 mutation carriers in a clinical trial to either receive this drug, denosumab, or placebo to see whether, in fact, denosumab can help prevent breast cancer and possibly other cancers in BRCA1 mutation carriers. This is the only way that you can really get a drug to the clinic. You need to do a formal clinical trial, just for example, as has been done with the COVID vaccines to, to make sure that you've got something that works and is also safe and effective. So this study is now underway in Australia. It's open at 15 sites um, around Australia, including in fact, at the Garvin Kinghorn in Sydney and some other sites in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, the uh, only about 30 to 40 percent of BRCA1 mutation carriers opt to have a mastectomy. So uh, there are 60 to 70 percent of, of carriers who don't have a mastectomy or put off the idea of that as a prevention strategy. And arguably, this is something in addition to their standard of care that uh, would be well worth considering. So I'm going to leave it there and thank you again for the. Um, the honour of speaking at this symposium and the recognition you've given me, but also I'd like to recognise the fantastic work that's being done by the Garvin. As you can see from this uh, suite of names here, um, this is not a single initiative. There are a huge number of people and funders that are involved with this, but I'd particularly like to acknowledge my partner in crime, Joan Visveda, who's been working, uh, we've been working together now for over 20 years. Um, uh, trying to tackle breast cancer questions in addition to those that I've talked to you about today. Um, and of course, the, the incredibly talented people that have helped us along the way, including our consumer advocates. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> what a wonderful presentation and what a uh, wonderful careers worth of research. You really are one of the leading breast cancer researchers in the world. And um, so a truly worthy uh, recipient of the award today. So thank you very much. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce you to another breast cancer researcher here at the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. It is Dr. Elizabeth Calden, along with being one of my colleagues, she's also a wonderful science communicator and she has kindly offered to uh, talk today and give a summary of some of the uh, re breast cancer research that is taking place here at the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. Over to you, Liz. Thank you, Alex. I hope, I hope you can all see my screen here um, as I start to tell you about some of the work um, at the Garvin Institute in Breast Cancer. Um, I'd like to thank um, the previous speakers, um, Nancy, for sharing um, your story, which really gives context to all of the work we do, and also Jeff, who's really inspiring for all of us here because he's been such a pioneer in so many areas of breast cancer research. Now, as you've seen from the presentation so far, um, breast cancer really remains a very significant health problem. Um, it leads to more than 3,000 deaths per year in Australia. And, and, and that, of course, is one of our goals to really reduce breast cancer-related deaths. But I think we've also got to reflect on how far we've come with breast cancer research. So 13 of, uh, out of every 100 women get breast cancer within their lifetime. But back in um, 1930, only three of those women would have been alive five years after that initial diagnosis. And with the efforts of research and with improved screening and improved diagnosis, we've now seen that figure really change 90 years later where 11 of those 13 women are alive five years after their initial diagnosis. But 
as you can see from the statistic I've given you of more than 3,000 women dying from breast cancer in Australia every, every year, we're really not fixing um, the breast cancer health problem in Australia. And part of that is due to disease recurrence. About 35% of breast cancers do recur within 15 years of their initial diagnosis. And those breast cancers are really quite difficult to treat. They often develop drug resistance. So what we've really seen with breast cancer research is we've seen that what was researched maybe 50 years ago in breast cancer has really shifted as, as the landscape has shifted of what problems we're really trying to address at the moment. So we still try to understand why a first breast cancer forms and tries to try to understand what's in that breast cancer. But now we focus on questions like, why does a breast cancer spread? Why does a breast cancer grow at different sites in the body? And why does a breast cancer become resistant to drugs? And all of these questions really funnel together to our overall question, which is how do we better diagnose patients, treat them better and give better quality of life to each and every person who has a diagnosis of breast cancer? Now, the team of people who are working on that at the Garvin Institute, I'm showing you um, a slide here with um, a picture of all the team leaders here at the Garvin Institute. And each of these people have a team associated with them of research assistants, research technicians, PhD students, postdoctoral researchers, who are all doing an incredible job trying to understand different breast cancer problems. And each of these people also have a collaborative network here in Australia and overseas. And what I'd like to do for the remainder of this presentation is just take you through some of the really wonderful findings from this group of people this year to highlight the work that's been taking place at the Garvin Institute. The first story I'd like to, um, to share with you is some work from Associate Professor um, David Gallego Ortega and Professor Chris Ormandy on understanding why pregnancy associated breast cancers can be more aggressive. So typically, um, if someone gets a breast cancer within five years of a pregnancy, these breast cancers have higher associated mortality. And in David and Chris's study, what they found is that these types of breast cancers are actually a bit different. Um, through their study of animal models. They found that these types of breast cancers actually secrete different factors into the surrounding tissue. And what that does is it actually changes the way that these cells are able to migrate to other parts of the body and for the cancer to spread. And with this type of information, they're now in the process of thinking about how can we actually better treat pregnancy associated breast cancers based on what's different to those breast cancers to other breast cancers that are first detected. In my group, we've also been working on what makes each breast cancer unique. And Professor Lindemann's told us an awful lot about familial breast cancers, cancers in women who have BRCA1 mutation. And that's what my group's been working on at looking at what's different about those breast cancers. So people with a BRCA1 mutation have a higher risk of um, cancer during their lifetime. But we've also been looking at how those cancer cells are actually different. They tend to grow faster. They have DNA damage pathways that are disrupted within those cancers. And this actually makes them susceptible to different drug combinations when those cancers are detected. And we've recently published this work and we're hoping to take this drug combination forward. The next part of research I'd like to tell you about is thinking about breast cancer cells and what actually makes breast cancer cells different to the rest of our bodies. So from the work of Professor Sue Clark's group, we've been able to find out that breast cancer cells actually have very different DNA. Professor Clark's group has really pioneered these studies showing that epigenetic changes happen on multiple levels within breast cancer cells. And these are tiny little marks on the DNA that change how the DNA is actually read so that these cells can develop characteristics that make them into cancer cells, such as growing faster, ignoring cell, dis, cell death um, information, and really just surviving in an inappropriate way rather than responding to the body's defences. And what Sue's group has done now is they've taken these changes and they've used them in a way now to apply them to better diagnose and possibly treat breast cancer. So Associate Professor Claire Sturzaker is doing work looking at how we can actually use these types of changes as a diagnostic tool. She's looking at whether we can use these changes detected from blood samples to figure out which patients we should be giving chemotherapy. 
And Dr. Joanna Ashinga-Kawaka in um, Professor Clark's group is looking at whether we can actually reverse these changes altogether. Can we actually take these little marks off the DNA so that we deprogram these breast cancer cells so they no longer act like breast cancer cells? So I've spoken to you about what makes breast cancer cells different to other cells in the body, but are breast cancer cells all the same as one another? Now, our own wonderful Professor Swar Associate Professor Swarbrick, who's our MC today, um, has really done some pioneering work in this area, looking at how within a breast cancer, all the cells are actually not the same as one another. When they were first looked at down the microscope by the first um, cancer pathologist, they did look very similar. But using a technique called single cell sequencing, um, Alex's group is now looking at how all of these cells can actually be different to one another. And using this technique, they found that there are in fact probably about at least 50 different types of cells in a breast cancer. And this is really important information because not every ca breast cancer cell is important for the spread of breast cancer or important for its aggressiveness. And we need to know which of those cells to target. What's particularly important about Alex's work is that he's created a shareable resource, which has now been published over several publications, allowing other researchers around the world to access this information to inform their own research and come up with better strategies to treat breast cancer. So I've talked about how the cells within a breast cancer are different to one another, but these cells also sit within the body and they actually modify the local environment around that cancer. And Associate Professor Tom Cox works particularly in this area, looking at what it is that holds the breast cancer there in place and how the breast cancer and its local environment interact. He's published a pivotal review in this area recently, but he's also working on techniques to actually analyse that local environment around the breast cancer and has um, recently published a great paper looking at how we can analyse that material to understand how that environment is modified. Now, at the beginning of this talk, I spoke about how we're really now focusing more and more on how cancers spread, on how cancers grow at different sites in the body and how they become drug resistant. So I now want to move on to focus on a project about cancer spread, and that's by Dr. Max Nobis and Professor Paul Timpson, looking at how cancer, cell, cancer cells move from the breast to other sites in the body. They've performed a really elegant study looking at how these cells go from these different sites and what's actually happening within those cells as they go from one site to another. They're able to use very sophisticated imaging techniques to look at what pathways are activated in those cells. And they've seen this pathway called the RAC pathway is activated in those cells. And not only that, they've been able to put drugs into these models and see that that pathway can get turned off by drugs. And this has great potential for drug development for breast cancer in the future. Now, the type of cancer they're working on there is triple negative breast cancer. And we, in fact, have quite a few groups focusing on triple negative breast cancer at the Garvin Institute because it's a very problematic disease. It's highly recurrent and often becomes resistant to drugs. And for our groups here at the Garvin Institute, um, we really focus on what are those cells that might be um, responsible for cancer spread from triple negative breast cancer. And Associate Professor Christine Schaff is working on that. We work on looking at what sort of drugs can we actually use to specifically treat triple negative breast cancer? How can we turn off molecular switches in those cancers? And that's been, um, that's research from Dr. Rob Weatherish. And finally, can we activate our own immune systems to actually fight these cancers? And that's work from Associate Professor Tatiana Chapnova here at the Garvin Institute. Um, Professor Linderman told us about estrogen responsive breast cancers in his talk, and that's an area that um, our own Professor Elgin Lim has continued working in with some really exciting findings being published this year. So for advanced breast cancers, which um, contribute to a lot of breast cancer mortality, about half of those are estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. They're breast cancers that are driven by hormones. And in a, this recent pivotal work, Professor um, Elgin Lim and his collaborators at the University of Adelaide have been looking at whether other sorts of hormones can be important, and in particular, whether androgens can be important. We normally think of androgens as being associated with male physiology, but in fact, androgens are in everybody's bodies, male or female. 
And it just so happens that in breast cancer, those androgen receptors in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer can sit there and be inactive. But what Professor Ming's group, along with his collaborators, has found is if we turn on the androgen activity in those breast cancers, it can actually drive down the estrogen activity in those breast cancers and stop those cancers growing. And this important work is now moving into clinical trials, looking at whether new generation androgen type drugs can be used to treat highly advanced estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. Now, just in the last minute, I'd like to um, just also give you a snapshot and an update on the work from um, the uh, winner of last year's Estee Lauder Award. It's been a difficult year in COVID to be um, continuing on with work in breast cancer research, but um, Dr. Sarah Alexandru, our winner from last year, has done a wonderful job. And she's working in a similar area to Professor Eljean Lim, looking at very advanced estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. And her work is to be is to, has been to look at how those cancers evolve. What changes happen in those cancers as they move from, become, from being sensitive to therapy to being resistant to therapy? And she's been using a technique called single cell sequencing. I'll show you a snapshot of this here. And in this picture, you can see in purple cells that are, are um, able to be treated by therapy, moving over to being resistant to therapy. And she's looking at what are the difference in the different states of these cells moving from sensitive to resistant to see if there's any vulnerabilities in these cells while they're still sensitive to therapy to add more therapy in to treat these types of breast cancer patients. And I'm really, uh, to watch this space, we're hoping to see some wonderful work coming further out from this preliminary data. So that's really been a whirlwind tour of 2021 in breast cancer research at the Garvin Institute. Um, and I'm really very privileged to work with such talented colleagues here at the Garvin. But I'd also really very much like to thank all the other people that make this possible. And that's really um, uh, many of the people in the audience here today. It's our clinical trial participants. It's our consumer advocates, our funding organisations and other donors who really make this work possible, not only through your actual contributions, but also in your, um, in your belief and passion for our work. So thank you so much for um, supporting us here at the Garvin. And so with that, I'd like to now um, pass over to Professor Elgin Lim who is going to give us an update on clinical trials here at the Garvin Institute. Thanks, Liz. All right, um, I've got a pleasure now to talk about um, the clinical trials that are run at St. Vincent's Hospital and the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. Um, so what are clinical trials? You know, we take it for granted that, that um, most people would know about it, but just to go through it, uh, clinical trials is a type of research that studies new tests and treatments um, and evaluates the effects um, in, on, on human health outcomes. And they could be an evaluation of new studies, new drugs in patients for the very first time. Or in later line, later phases of the trials, um, they are typically compared to current standards of care. Um, but clinical trials can also include non-therapeutic studies. We have a very large breast cancer trial program at the Kinghorn Cancer Center. And as, as Nancy alluded to, our patients really are our partners uh, in this research endeavor, because some of these trials might not necessarily benefit the patients directly, uh, but it will certainly help us uh, make the world a better place for the next generation of women uh, or men who um, develop breast cancers. And our clinical trial portfolio includes academic trials, which are trials like such as the ones that Jeff has spoken about, um, where, where he's leading it. But we've also got pharmaceutical sponsored trials and the clinical trial activity in Australia is increasing year on year. Um, these are the uh, therapies that are currently being evaluated at the Kinghorn Cancer Center. And we've got um, in excess of 14 trials currently being run. Um, these include trials for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, um, and there are new classes of um, drugs that, that target the hormone receptors. Um, um, and we've also got a number of targeted therapies um, for, for new targets um, found in cancer cells, um, illustrated in the, the left panel below. Um, we've also got trials with immunotherapies or cancer vaccines. That's just really uh, trying to harness 
one's immune system uh, to attack the cancer cell. And then uh, we've also got a genomic uh, medicine program at the Kinghorn Cancer Center, where uh, we're testing new ways to characterize the tumor um, using modern genomic testing um, strategies in order to identify new and novel targets in breast cancer. And there are also classes of drugs, um, which are what we call antibody drug conjugates, which is really a combination of both an antibody and a drug together um, that has also been shown to be quite effective in some instances and new, the next generation of these dr drugs are coming through. Um, um, we've also got other types of trials being evaluated evaluated at the Kinghorn that are non-therapeutic. Um, so prevention trials, such as the one that Jeff uh, Lindemann spoke about earlier on, uh, we're running that prevention trial here at the Kinghorn. We've got supportive care trials, looking at trying to optimize the um, management of side effects of some um, of the common uh, drugs used to treat breast cancer and try to minimize its toxicity. We've got liquid-based tumor testing studies, which is essentially the next generation of tumor testing. Instead of having to necessarily do a biopsy, uh, we can actually look for circulating tumor DNA in the patient's blood. And then finally, we've got novel imaging studies uh, at, at the uh, Kinghorn Cancer Center as well, as we have a very active um, nuclear medicine research department uh, at St. Vincent's Hospital. Um, a key part of our um, clinical research is it's very, very strong links with the basic researchers at the Garvin, at UNSW, and with our collaborators. Um, patient tissue um, is the fundamental building block of our research. Much as we would also use petri dishes and mice, not, nothing really beats the study of human tissue. And as a result, we really need our patients to come forward and partner with us um, by providing their tissues for research. And we collect a, re a range of tissue from normal tissue all the way to pre-cancer, all the way to metastatic cancer where it, it, it um, invades or uh, metastasizes to an organ. And um, together with our patients, we collect these um, tumors to uh, enable us to decipher mechanisms of treatment resistance, mechanisms of cancer progression or metastases, and also importantly, it allows us to establish uh, important laboratory cancer models in which we can then use as a resource for our research. Um, one initiative um, that we've been working on, and it's been held up a little bit by COVID, but we hope to launch at the end of this year, is a clinical trials navigator called Clinical Trials Connect. Um, and this is really just to uh, enable uh, patients to find clinical trials across the country. Uh, we don't really have something like this for patients at this point in time. Um, and this is um, presented in, with lay language, providing up-to-date information on clinical trials. Um, and it allows the patient in a way to bypass their oncologist and to search for clinical trials that may be relevant to them. And in, in another important part of this platform, it's um, for for um, uh, patients to connect directly with Australian cancer researchers and find out more about their work. So we hope to uh, launch this uh, at the end of this year. So please do look out for it. Finally, a thank you to all patients and their families who have partnered with us in our quest to improve the outcome of patients uh, with breast cancer. You can find out a little bit more about the clinical trials through this link. Over uh, Back over to you, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Eugene. What a wonderful summary of the um, of the many diverse strands of clinical activity and clinical trial activity going on here on campus. The Kinghorn Cancer Centre, being an academic um, clinical centre, is very much um, links research into clinical treatment of of um, cancers. So we've reached the point of the proceedings today where we're going to give an opportunity for, for you to ask questions of our participants. And I'll remind you that if you have a question, please pop them into the Q&A um, section. We won't be able to answer everything and, and we won't be able to answer anything that relates to an individual health question, um, but we hope to touch on some of your questions. And so um, I'm going to start off while we wait for additional questions to come in here. Um, by asking Elgin a follow-up question, you know, we heard from Liz in her summary of research that you've been working on androgen receptor 
We've heard a lot about the female hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and you might think that androgen relates to men because it's the receptor for testosterone. What does that have to do with breast cancer? Uh, thanks, uh, Alex. Yeah, the androgen receptor is actually um, expressed in the vast majority of um, tumors that express the estrogen receptor. So it's less sexy than the estrogen receptor, but it's certainly around. Um, and I think one of the things is that we've tried to learn from our prostate cancer colleagues who target the androgen receptor really well, uh, because that's the main target in prostate cancer. But unlike prostate cancer, um, the strategy in which we, we target the androgen receptor is a little bit different in breast cancer, which makes breast cancers a little bit unique. Um, so the clinical trials um, for this, um, the first phase of it has con concluded. We were uh, fortunate to be one of the sites selected internationally to run that first phase of trials. But because we have a, a very intimate insight and understanding of the biology of the androgen receptor, we now actually will be leading the uh, next phase of clinical trials with this class of drugs uh, moving forward. It's really exciting. And um, you know, from what I understand, these drugs are often very well tolerated by women and can often lead to improvements in their body condition, not just treating their, their cancer. That's correct. Um, Liz, I'm going to throw a question to you. Um, you did such a wonderful job summarizing the, the diverse research that's going on here in the division, but we didn't really hear much about your research, which is really very exciting. And um, I know some of what you do studies um, the scenario where a patient becomes resistant to the treatment that we've given them. While, while many women do respond to the drugs we have, a proportion of women um, don't have a durable response and they, their cancer grows um, uh, after a while. What's your research teaching you about resistance to some of these common cancer drugs? Um, thanks, Alex. Um, it's really, yeah, it's really nice to have a have a chance to um, share some of the research we're doing in this area. Look, I think what we're really finding comes back to um, the multifaceted approach we're now taking to breast cancer. We're finding that there's lots of lo lots and lots of different routes towards resistance in different patients and in different cancer cells. So we can't be simplistic in the way we think about resistance to therapy. We've actually really got to um, think very broadly and go, cancer cells are actually unfortunately very clever. They can actually think of lots and lots of different ways to get around drugs. And we have to be just as clever. We have to not just see what a patient was like before a drug was given and once the cancer becomes resistant, we have to think about that process that a cancer goes through as they might acquire resistance to therapy. We might find, I think now that perhaps it's not just a matter of treating a cancer once it becomes resistant to therapy, we might start having to modify our initial therapies, doing more combination therapies that, so that cancers don't become resistant to different classes of therapies. So we're, I think, you know, it's a really moving field and I'm, I'm hoping that we can make a real impact in this space in the future. Great, thanks Liz. Um, so we have a question here um, for Professor Lindemann and, and it really relates to um, this journey that you took us on from the normal breast and how it functions and the emergence of breast cancer from the normal breast. And um, the way that having a mutation in certain genes such as BRCA1 puts those women at very high risk of developing breast cancer. How does that work? What do we know about the, the, the function of BRCA1 that acts as this kind of gatekeeper between the normal breast and breast cancer? So it's an important question. The BRCA1, um, and in fact, a lot of the genes that are form hereditary cancer genes are involved in uh, double-stranded DNA repair. So, um, uh, every time a cell does divides, there's the chance of a mishap um, and uh, that needs to be repaired in a high fidelity fashion. So new mutations don't arise in cells. Uh, BRCA1 is important for that high fidelity repair. I can see there was a question in the um, chat about RAD51C. That's also another gene involved in DNA repair. Um, and so 
what can happen is if the repair doesn't happen properly, that can introduce new mutations. And then there could be a potential cascade of events which ultimately culminate in breast cancer. We know that you don't um, get cancer just from one mutation. It's often a, a, a set of mutations. There's another important gene called P53, which um, is often mutated very early um, for these types of tumours and also in ovarian cancer. Thank you, Jeff. And I, so I think you, you know, your work, one of the really exciting potentials of it is by identifying these patients at very high risk, you can now um, move us into a space where prevention of breast cancer is within reach. And that's really somewhere that I think, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, we really weren't certain we could possibly ever get to. Yeah, no, I think that's right. It's a really exciting time. I, and, and as you and Liz pointed out um you know by, by studying the different cell types in the breast and down to this single cell level we can really identify um how the cells are talking to each other which ones are misbehaving and which are then potential targets and that's uh, not only important for treatment of course it's uh, important at that preventive level because the best thing we could hope for in the long term of course is to switch off cancers even before they start yeah so we've got a really interesting question in the uh, Q&A here, which is asking about how, how do we get from these kind of fundamental bio biological discoveries that we've heard about today into practice changing medicine? What are the steps that we go through? And I thought I'd throw this open to the panel. I know all of you have experience in this, taking um, laboratory-based discoveries into the clinic. Uh, I, I might start, Alex, and say it, it takes a few years off your life. Um, it's um, it, it's an onerous but important process, and I, I guess it's been very interesting to watch the rapid development of vaccines for COVID, and it just shows you how much concerted effort can do to help fast track good drug development, um, as we've seen with the vaccines. But for for cancer therapies, um, if you've identified the target, you often need to then. Um, get some medicinal chemists to help identify ways of um, actually developing drugs. And that's a whole new special, uh, important specialty in itself. Uh, uh, for some of the studies we, and I know Elgin can talk about, uh, there are drugs that have been developed and, and uh, that's an opportunist, opportunity for seeing if you can then uh, use those to, to address um, uh, you know, that, that area that you've identified. It then requires very sophisticated studies. There are preclinical studies that usually happen in mice. Um, if they're first in human type compounds, they often get tested in primates uh, just for safety. But then they have to go through rigorous testing through early phase studies. So something called first in human studies, um, then phase one studies where you look at um, safety issues and help find the right dose. Then phase two studies where you um, further look for a safety and efficacy signal. And ultimately then the phase three study, which really can demonstrate whether the drug works or not, properly characterize side effects. And um, it's those sorts of later, level studies that really are important for drug registration by uh, groups such as the TGA that we all know how to pronounce uh, thanks to COVID. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, and I, and I guess that's a very long and involved process. Um, and it's interesting that you touched on those two different paths to finding a drug. One is developing it from scratch based on a target that you find. The other is what we sometimes call repurposing, which is taking a drug used in other applications. Elgin mentioned prostate cancer, for example, and then applying that to a novel scenario. Elgin, how important is um, are these tissue banks where patients um, partner with you, consent to donate their, their surplus cancer tissue? How important are those tissue banks in that path from basic discoveries through to um, medicines? Oh, it's critical. Um... And Jeff, um, you know, is, is probably the person I, I learned most about. Jeff was the director of the Victorian Cancer Biobank for a number of years. And he, in fact, set that up. Um, all, all my research when I was doing it with Jeff was based on human tissue, uh, patients contributing their tissues. So um, it, it really allows us to, to study directly into human biology without necessarily having to go through the intermediate steps of, of mice and, and cell lines. Um, so uh, I think it's critical. 
Um, I think, you know, Australia, in a way, being a relatively small country, uh, is uh, a challenging um, place because we're, you know, obviously competing against the big countries uh, like the US where um, there's a lot more infrastructure towards um, drug development. Um, however, I, I think the landscape is changing. Um, and, you know, there are things that we can do really well in Australia, and we really need to focus on those. Um, and I think, you know, there, there's a great um, number of cancer researchers, particularly in breast cancer in Australia, that um, work throughout that whole pathway from discovery uh, to clinical trials um, that we have in place already. So it's going to be exciting times to hit the, the opportunities are growing. Thanks, Elgin. And, you know, we're, we're broadcasting across Australia today, and there are a lot of questions in the Q&A about how people can get involved, whether that be participating um, just in data collection, for example, sharing their experience and sharing tissues or being involved in clinical trials. What's, a, what's the best path for people to get involved, um, no matter what kind of stage of the disease um, path they're on? Elgin, would you like to have a go at that? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you can get involved at any stage. Um, you know, I think we're all, uh, the important thing is to realize that we're all on the same team. We're all on this fight together against breast cancer. Um, um, you can get involved by being an advocate. You can get involved by uh, participating in a research, uh, a clinical study. You can participate by um, donating your tissue. Um, um, for research. I, I know a few people have actually asked how they can do that. So hopefully we can get back to you. Um, and, and um, you know, I think we need to, as a collective um, advocate for, for breast cancer research, advocate that our governments invest more into um, research. And, um, and I, I think collectively we, we can make a difference. Thanks, Elgin. So I think in the interest of time, um, we're, we're gonna, we've come to the end of this symposium. It's been a really wonderful day. And I really wanna thank, um, firstly, our award recipient, Professor Jeff Lindemann for a stunning um, tour de force really um, through the last two decades of research. I wanna thank my co-hosts, Elgin Lim and Liz Colden um, for, for joining us. Thank um, Estee Lauder for their wonderful support of these research awards for our young scientists and for supporting um, this seminar. And I want to thank you all for joining us. You know, we've, we've had something in the range of 250 people online today. And it's, a, I think, a sign of um, really the excitement uh, and interest in the community. And finally, I really want to thank Nancy for that really heartfelt um, interview and the way she shared her own experience with all of us. So thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And um, thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>